What's going on YouTube Metal Complex here and today I've got a very interesting knife overview to do with you guys. This is a custom knife by maker Chad Nell. I've been I think pronouncing him uh, pronouncing his name Chad Neal. Uh, this is the MB1 Warncliffe. Beautiful, beautiful hand rub satin custom Warncliffe uh, grind. Um, this is a knife that was provided for review uh, to me by my good buddy Jeff Goodenow, which is a name you guys should be well familiar with on my channel. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with my channel, um, I am a, um, I'm a knife enthusiast. Um, I like to do um, daily uploads. I like to do knife overviews and knife reviews, unboxings. I have a Knife Guy series on Sundays. Um, so if you like constant knife content, um, but you want a laid back channel, this might be the channel for you. So go ahead and subscribe and uh, make sure those notifications are set to all. Anyways, uh, my buddy Jeff sent this along. He bought this and I believe actually Jeff, it's, it's already sold. <laughs> So this is gone. Uh, anybody who's, you know, I, I know um, people have contacted Jeff directly, um, you know, wanting to purchase some of his knives. But uh, Jeff provides some amazing knives for review. I mean, content on this channel. Um, but um, this knife, um, I was not a, uh, I was not aware of this maker, and so I did a little bit of um, research on him. And I'm actually going to bring out the um, case and I'll bring out this card here um, and mainly the case in an attempt to maybe maybe I'll use the card in an attempt to get it to stand up it's not it's not going to do that but um, anyways I did some research on him and um, the story goes these are made in Utah by the way I'm sure you can tell by the case um, the story goes is that when he was younger his um, dad used to enjoy finding um, arrowheads and you know um, or essentially creating arrowheads uh, from from scratch from basically the you know rocks and things he would find now I hope I'm, I'm getting this correctly I've, I've got this information off of Arizona custom knives and so he developed his own appreciation for things being um, created from scratch which is I, I think that's really cool I've, I've never been able to create something from start to finish with my bare hands that I, I can say is, is a product of precision handwork. Um, so that's something I can appreciate in the form of other people's creations, namely folding knives, but not something I can say I've ever experienced for myself. And I'm, I'm so envious of people who have that level of passion. I'm a passionate person when it comes to taking somebody else's creation and going, wow, look how good this is, or wow, I don't like this. Like that's, you know, that's one thing, but Anybody can do that, you know. Um, the only the only thing that people, I think the only reason you guys watch this channel is because I get really excited and I yell and I get really animated. Um, but I, I don't have the level of passion that would be required to create something like this. So I, I, I'm very envious of that. I think that's really, really cool. Um, now, forgive me if I'm wrong. I believe his uncle was, is it Steve Johnson? Legendary knife maker Steve Johnson. I hope I'm getting that correct. If I'm not correct, I will edit it with a caption. Um, but uh, uh, so he um, had the, uh, you know, he was fortunate in that he could practice under the um, under the wing of Steve Johnson. Now, I'm, I'm not um, somebody who knows a lot about Steve Johnson. In fact, that was not a name that was familiar to me. And I'm sure a lot of people watching this channel are like, oh, my gosh, unsubscribed, you know. Um, but uh, apparently he was very influential in the knife world. And uh, Mr. Chad Neal to work under him so developed a very practiced hand and uh obviously i mean it's it, uh um it was experience and and time um well spent because the final product here in this very first example that i've ever handled is nothing short of amazing honestly this is an incredible knife um this is not going to be a review this is going to be more of an overview because this is a custom knife um, and people who are interested in custom knives um, are um, in kind of kind of a different world. Um, a lot of what you can get with this knife is something, you know, in terms of function, it's something that can be achieved in a less expensive production knife. But the reason that people buy high-end custom knives is not because they think that the hundreds or extra thousands of dollars they throw at it is going to somehow put them at a tactical or functional advantage over people who are only spending one, two, or three hundred dollars on a knife. It's because they enjoy the idea of a handmade item, a fully handmade item, and they also probably enjoy the idea of having something unique, having something exclusive. Um, so there always seems to be at least one person who wants to remind everybody that um, there's no reason to spend X amount of money on a knife because you can spend, you know, uh, an eighth the price and get the same thing. 
you're not informing anybody. You're not helping anybody. People know that. The people who are interested in custom knives do not care. <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna buy what they love they're gonna buy what makes them happy which is something that all of us share all of us like to buy things that make us happy either from a functional standpoint or from you know just enjoying the object itself its aesthetics its feel its look you know all that stuff so anyways what we have here is a CTS XHP Warncliffe blade with a beautiful hand rub satin finish and let me tell you something um, this blade was perfectly executed. It is absolutely perfect, and it even has some slight crowning on the tip there. Um, this is a nice size knife. You know, we I started talking, and I didn't really do my usual measurements and things, so let's go ahead and take some measurements here. It's not wanting to stand up perfectly straight because of the position of the pocket clip, but um, I can still get a measurement on it. Overall length of this guy coming in at seven and a quarter inches overall from tip to scale. Uh, that you're looking at a three, well, in places it's a three and an eighth, and in other places you could say it's as long as three and a quarter. Um, the actual blade length or the cutting edge is not quite three inches. It's about 2.8, 2.85, 2.9, which I imagine in some places will help out with legality stuff, you know, if it's not quite three inches. But I feel like they measure the blade, the overall blade length, and it's, you know, just a little, it's a hair over three inches. So um, that it probably, you know, it's as Nick Chavez always puts it, if the, the uh, police officer um, doesn't like you, um, then it, it's probably one of the situations where they're going to call it over a three inch blade, which it is, you know, by the measurement it is. Um, let's go ahead and do some size comparisons here up against the Ontario Rat 1. Rat 1 is coming in at 8.6 inches overall. How about up against the Spyderco PM2? Spyderco PM2 coming in at 8.3 inches overall. How about up against the Benchmade Griptilian, or in this case, the Ritter Hogue? Ritter Hogue coming in at 8 inches overall, so we're getting a little bit closer there. And last but not least, the Spyderco Para 3. Para 3 also coming in at 7 and a quarter inches. So you can see there, this is a Para 3 size knife. Now, the blade length on uh, the, MP, the MB1 is longer and the cutting edge is longer because there's not it's not quite the same position of choil. Interestingly, though enough, there is actually a place for you to lock in up here. It's kind of an interesting, it's, I wouldn't call it, it kind of is a forward choil, but not a traditional choil like you would see on the uh, Para 3. It sort of just follows the same line as the blade and then curves into the flipper tab and then is just conveniently crafted to be a place that you can put your finger. Um, so interesting. Now the, the big difference is, is that, um, you know, back here, whereas on the Para 3, even back here, I can get my whole hand around the blade. This is definitely a three finger position knife from here. If I move up, yeah, I can get my whole hand around the blade, which is something I really, really prefer. You know, it's not, it's not a deal breaker if I can't get four fingers back here, as long as there's a place for me to choke up and hold the knife all the way around without putting my rest of my finger on the blade. Um, as long as there's a position up there that I can do that, I, I really like it. In a smaller blade, I really, really like that. So that's very impressive. Let's take a look here at the, um, the scales. What we have are contoured and polished brown micarta scales. Um, it looks like the edges are sharp here, but really they're just, it's like micro rounding. And there are some hard angles and some points, you know, but they are still nicely rounded off and smooth. It's not as smooth as like the edges of the pair of three, but it's also not going to dig into your hands. We also, the thing that is really, um, you know, kind of in our face is this Amoeba Timascus pivot collar. Beautiful, around a very simple polished button head uh, Torx pivot. You have a couple of uh, Torx screws holding the scales on. Um, they're the little tiny size, but I feel like a knife of this caliber, you're probably not going to want to be taking it apart all the time. I wouldn't be, so I don't know that I care nearly as much, but it's something to point out. These are going to be the little teeny tiny size, and you're going to risk screwing the screw up or screwing up your tool if you get in there. Um, the thing that I really think is impressive is the absolute seamlessness of the scale up against the beefy titanium liners. Look, I mean, it's perfect. It is perfect <laughs> all the way around. That is awesome. It is truly seamless. Beautiful. Check this out back here. 
seamless amoeba timascus backspacer that has the lines running like vertically. I mean, like that's got to be a difficult section of a chunk of timascus to find. You know, maybe not. I don't. I don't know how that works, but beautiful, absolutely beautiful. By the way, yeah, the blade's perfectly centered. It's perfect. Check out the pocket clip. It's kind of a skinny clip, but it also goes with the knife. And this is, you know, it's a custom knife. You know, it's going to have some aesthetic features that are in favor over um, some functional features, though this is a very functional knife, and we'll talk about that. Um, excellent uh, retention, excellent look to the um, pocket clip. Really, really beautiful. It's going to carry about right here, which is kind of medium. And then, of course, we've got another um, pivot collar on the other side and also another side for adjustment. So I don't know if it's a free spinning pivot or if you need two um, Torx tools to, um, you know, adjust that or take it apart. But it uh, looks like that's the way that it is. Like I said, uh, perfect centering. The, um, the action on this guy, we're doing things totally out of order because this is an overview. The detent is tuned to absolute perfection. The de there is no detent lash. The um, flipper tab is very comfortable to rest your finger on. It's in exactly the right shape. There's a nice landing zone down here. It will fire. It is, there is, there's not a way to fail this. Whether you, I mean, it's, it is definitely a push button because of that ramp. I mean, you can light switch it. It's going to work, but this is so comfortable and so organic to just flip and fire out. The detent is nice. It's, it's medium heavy, but not in an obnoxious way. I'll show you guys. Nice, satisfying click. I love that. That click lets me know that the detent ball is in the hole. There's no rattle. It's perfect. It should just click like that and be hard enough to be able to deploy the knife perfectly. Also, it's glassy, glassy smooth. This is a brand new knife. So the only thing that's keeping it from being false shut is probably the small size and weight of the blade, but also just the tightness of a new knife. As far as friction between the detent ball and the path that it's forming on the blade, there's none. It's absolutely buttery smooth. It's running on bearings over time as the gentleman, whoever purchased this knife, let me tell you something, buddy. Over time, as you keep playing with this and flipping with this, it's just going to get smoother and smoother and smoother, and you're going to love it. You're absolutely going to love it. You can see the lockup here is at a nice, just a perfect, it's like a 30% lockup. Absolutely solid. No blade play up, down, left, or right. This is a really high quality piece and it's in a size that I appreciate. You know, it's a little thick from here. If I'm being honest, we've got some we've got some beefiness here, but we've got some nice thick dependable liners that feel really really good. Let's go ahead and weigh it here. Overall weight of the MB1 in my Carta, not bad. 3.84 ounces. It's half an ounce heavier than the pair of 3. Or not even half an ounce. It's a quarter ounce heavier than the Para 3, roughly. So yeah, you know, it's the same size. You got titanium liners that are pretty beefy. Some nice contoured micarta scales that are nice to the look and nice to the touch. 3.84 ounces. It's heavier than a lot of knives at seven and a quarter ounce. But is it something to, you know, is it a deal breaker? No, absolutely not. It's a, it's a great carry size and carry profile and carry weight. As far as thickness goes, up against the Hogue Ritter, you can see we're a little bit thicker than the Hogue Ritter. How about the Rat 1? A little bit thicker than the Rat 1. How about the PM2? Even though these are aftermarket scales, a little bit thicker than the PM2. And, you know, as it's going to be the same thing with the Pair 3, a little bit thicker than Pair 3. So it's a little bit thicker, but the contouring on the scales gives a nice, you know, fill out the hand feeling. And it just it feels good. It feels smooth. And because you can lock in right there, you know, you can't get your finger all the way up here without risking cutting it, but you can get up here and do some nice, delicate work. I would have really preferred to see a little bit of jimping back here, given that this area of the blade is not crowned and this area is. I know you can do jimping on crowning, but you know, it would have been a nice place for some jimping, not that big of a deal. That's really the only criticism I have about the blade. There's no um, there's no defined sharpening choil, so if you're gonna use this and resharpen it, uh, it might give you a little bit of trouble, but it's not gonna be the worst thing in the world. Um, the blade stock thickness appears to be it's probably about the same as the Ritter Hogue. So now it's a little bit thicker. Ritter Hogue's 125 thousandths. PM2 is 145 thousandths. So I'm going to call this about 135 thousandths. For those of you with the Spyderco Manix 2, it's about the same thickness. The standard one, not the lockback one. So um, that's a, a, a decent thickness of blade. Um, there's a flat that runs out about 60% the length and runs into the swedge here, which is very nice. 
Very nice looking worn cliff. And then you have a drop to the edge. The edge is sharpened absolutely perfect. This is glassy, nice and sharp. This will be a nice little gentleman's working tool. You know, um, it's not, I wouldn't call it a hard use knife. I would call it a gentleman's knife that is capable of doing harder work than your standard gentleman's folding knife. Um, I really appreciate titanium liner locks and liner locks in general because as you're squeezing them, you know, yeah, the advantage sometimes in a frame lock is that you can hold that lock bar in place under heavy pressure. This is not a knife that I'm going to be, you know, going out and prying up steel doors and doing crazy hard work with. No, this is going to be a knife that I'm just going to use for simple cutting tasks or that I would use for simple cutting tasks, you know, or take to formal events if I was actually going to use it. It would be more of a dressy knife. I can use it for some harder cuts, but I don't have to worry about that lock bar being, you know, messed with depending on how hard I have to hold it. It's simply going to lock up where it's going to lock up and that should increase the life of it over time because it's not going to be forced over because of my hand pushing on it. It's also really easy to interact with because you have this nice cutout area and it's slightly higher than where the scale is. So it's very easy to get your finger in there and it will continue to be easy as time progresses and the lock bar wears over only slightly. Um, this is a very well executed knife. Like I said, my only criticisms really are the little teeny tiny screws. That's something you're gonna see. Um, the, the scales are a little bit thick and there's some areas that are, I wouldn't say sharp, but just sort of abrupt in their drop. Um, and I'd like to see some jimping on it, but I'm not a custom knife maker and this is my very first experience with um, the work of Chad Nell. Um, and I'm impressed with it. I think this is great. Um, if you're wondering, um, I think there are a few more offerings, some custom offerings on DLT trading at least. I think that's where Jeff got this one. Um, I don't think that his work is in abundance. I don't think that you can always go out and find something, but it seems like uh, most of his pieces are pretty unique. So if you do pick something up from Mr. Chad Nell, it's probably going to have um, a decent amount of uniqueness to it. This particular model ran $800, which is about kind of what I was thinking. Um, I think that's a competitive price, you know, in the knife world. I, oftentimes I expect custom knives to run at least $800, um, oftentimes over $1,000. Generally what I see is $1,000 to $1,500 for a custom piece, and it's not uncommon even in a smaller gentleman's carry size such as this. So $800 I think is fine. But again, that's directed at people who are in the custom market. If you have never handled a custom knife, if you are used to budget knives, or you're just used to the high-end production world or mid-tech world where you're paying for knives that are between $200 and about $500, then it's probably not going to make a whole lot of sense. Um, but yeah, his work is very recommendable to people, you know, amongst the, the custom knife enthusiasts. Absolutely. This is a very beautiful piece. Um, that's going to be pretty much it for the review today, guys. Um, to the new owner of this knife, um, I will be shipping this out soon, and you are really going to enjoy it, buddy. This is really, really nice. Um, if you enjoyed this video or at least found it entertaining, please leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do, of course, have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like, so check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, then please subscribe to my channel because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching, everybody, and have a great day.